Let, let me introduce you, Please. okay? Now, I'm, but I can't introduce all of you, okay? But uh, I met Ron way back in another century. <laughs> and so for you young guys like Steve and Kyle, y'all can't even think like this, okay? But it was the late 80s, and I had walked into a church on staff, massive church conflict. I'm talking about the pastor and the minister of education. They were, it, it was just bad, okay? And I'm young, and I am blowing up and melting down because the first guy that got shot at when the minister of education, who had been there for years, first guy he shot at was me because I was the new guy. And uh, anyway, but, but I went to a thing that, Ron, that you did where you had taken, because your background, you started off as a professional counselor being on church staff. Actually, I think you started the uh, counseling center here at Cartersville, didn't you? I did. At yeah. Tabernacle Church back years ago with John Yarborough. Uh, so that was, uh, I think, about the fourth counseling center we had set up. Yeah. And I started out at Eastside uh, Church uh, in Marietta and then uh, expanded to uh, down on south of Atlanta in the Fayetteville area and then out in, um, in, the, in East Atlanta. And just have had a had a great opportunity to to integrate Christian counseling into the community and have it supported by the local church. So that was where Ron, we're you were part of that early generation that really started doing biblical Christian counseling. And uh, so, guys, I went through something, and man, it helped me in a tremendous way to see myself. And he matched it with a biblical character. And did the strengths of a biblical character, but also their weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, it was absolutely brilliant. It helped me so much. And, of course, I left, and you, you were friends with my dad, did a bunch of stuff there. But I left to go to Alabama and then to Macon and then move back up here. And I was, I kept thinking, I need to find Ron Brown to see if he could do, come do that stuff up here. And then I found out you live right south of here, right? Right by Emerson. Right by Emerson. And I was like, oh, my gosh. And so... <laughs> We reconnected, and I found out that you've done, I mean, God's used you in some incredible ways, and that you started taking all that stuff, turning it into leadership stuff, and you're doing corporate coaching now and stuff, And but you started you started a long time ago with uh, the Cathy's doing Chick-fil-A training and leadership training with them and stuff like that, so here's what we're going to do, guys. We're just going to, we're just going to talk, and I'll ask questions. If you want to ask a question, you can ask a question. Because this is a real informal, okay, I get to get, pick the brain of somebody who God has used in an unusual way. And uh, so, so I, gotta, I advertise. You've got to be careful about that. i got to caution you at the beginning because when, when uh, David talks about the differences in my career with being a therapist and then I'm a, been involved in missions, been involved in corporate work, I've been involved in sports psychology arena, uh, and showed up a lot of places. Well, one of the Chick Fil A CFOs said, "Ron, you know who you remind me of?" And I said, "No, uh, who's that?" He said, "Forrest Gump." <laughs> <laughs> he says, "You you show up with your box of chocolates, and you know you never know where you're going to see you." And so I I wanted you to know, be careful about getting into the brain of Forrest Gump here. But anyhow, that's just the word. Ron, you know one of the things that we want to hear, but. Before you do that, because I wanted you to say, hey, what did you start saying to these Chick-fil-A guys years ago that they come back and said, because when you were telling them, but give me a little bit of your story, because it's a crazy story, because you have done a lot of things that most of us are like, wow, that's a strange journey. So tell us a little bit about what God's had you doing. Well, let me let me just back up. I, I was born in, in uh, Kennesaw at Marietta, so I'm a, one, one of those that's uh, natives uh, of here, but I grew up in Smyrna. And uh, I became a Christian, came to Christ at uh, 16 years of age. So it was very early. And so I, I joined a, what was called the Metro Bible Study. It was about 10 people who started this. And it ended up over the years to be uh, about 3,000 people every Tuesday night. It was when uh, 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 young uh, Christians would come and be discipled. Uh, Dan DeHaan was our, our main teacher. And we began to really just see the effects of the Jesus Revolution. Y'all saw the movie, The Jesus Revolution? Mm -hmm. Well, I cried all the way through that because 
that I was a product of that Jesus revolution and it coming from California here to Atlanta. So the Lord had just put on my heart and he called me to missions and ministry uh, when I was 18. I was at Roswell Street Baptist and uh, I, I, I uh, you know, sensed a call and uh, that's when I dedicated my my, my life to Jesus and not just to Jesus but to however he wanted to use me and, ser and serve so uh, out of that I uh, went to uh, college and uh, played basketball there and so I was a sports minded person and uh, but then uh, as I as I got out of, of undergraduate I decided well, where is I going to go to seminary directly or where and the Lord opened up the door for an organization called now it's called Richmond Graduate University and it was one of the early Christian counseling programs in the country that integrated uh, psychological truth and and uh, uh, and biblical truth and so I became sort of an early adopter of the whole Christian counseling movement and there was one psychiatrist that was a Christian in Atlanta that I knew and uh, he had his Atlanta Counseling Center, and we set up what was called Alpha Care, or Christian Counseling Service that became Alpha Care. So we began to, right from the beginning, I knew I wanted to work within the local church community. And I, I really uh, got favor through the, uh, the churches here in this area, and the Lord just used it. But I want you to know, we were pioneers, and back then, if you were talking about personalities or behavioral styles or psychology, I mean, we were put under a microscope about we were secularist and you know we we were denying biblical biblical reality and and uh, so a friend of mine and I uh, out of Houston uh, we were seeing this and we were saying you know we see Jesus and we see the way in which God used different personalities all throughout the Bible. And so we actually wrote a book called Understanding How Others Misunderstand You. And we took the, the if any of you have taken the DISC profile or the Myers-Briggs profile or any of those, where those are four-factor model instruments about dominant, influencing, steady, and cautious. Those are the styles that are represented. You go into a lot more depth uh, beyond that. But we began to see that God used different personalities to accomplish his purpose. The Apostle Paul was the dominant directing type. And then Peter was the influencing relator type. And then Barnabas was the steady supporter type. And then James was the cautious conscientious type. That's just a rough uh, element. Well, when we published that, we thought, oh, this is great for the church until there was a book that came out back then called by Diedrich Bobgen that wrote the book Prophets of Psycho Heresy. <laughs> well, Ken and I, uh, Ken Bosch and I, we had a whole chapter in there as being accused of the prophets of psycho heresy. We didn't have the internet back then, so thank the Lord that that didn't, uh, didn't go beyond. Well, you can hey, still look it up. Hey, Rob, let, let's stop. Okay, guys. Yeah, now, just, you got to see this, okay? In each one of those four quadrants, there's multiple different kinds of things. But... Uh, Y'all take a guess as who I came out like. Oh. Thomas, Downing Thomas. Yeah. <laughs> Peter. I said, you, I can't, I, I've taken it a number of times. I came out as a Peter every time, which Peter had a strength. But, Ron, one of the things that that thing showed me, well, what was Peter's weakness? And, man, when I sat there and looked, okay, Peter could jump on something, step out there, open his mouth. Yeah. And be, ready, fire, aim. That boom. is Peter. Yes. And, and guys, I learned that Peter would waffle later on under pressure. And I learned, okay, don't take a stand. Don't say something until. Hmm. And, and at that time, I might have been in the midst of a church conflict. And what God was really saying was, shut your mouth, David. You're getting in trouble. Well, <laughs> Even when I was right. I mean, you were. And, and, and that's all. I mean, we all have had experiences some personalities there's the natural style to be outgoing expressive but even those who are more introspective and reflective 
You know, sometimes that, uh, you know, we get, we get our, ourselves into trouble by making opinions about something before we really understood the, understand the full context. So one of the things that, that I learned early on uh, was how important it was to listen uh, and not to be so, uh, uh, I guess, uh, prescriptive about what needed to happen. My first uh, counseling supervision, uh, we had to, we we had little tapes. Yeah, it was, it, it wasn't the uh, the you know what was the old version? Real, the, real, real, yeah, real, real, real. Yeah, well, it was a little real, real. So I I I, I taped my first uh, client, uh, and we had to come back and play it to our supervisor. So I played it, and boy, I went on, and I was listening to my words, and I was going, oh, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I nailed it. I nailed it. Well, after I got finished, the supervisor said, now Ron, how can you say in two sentences what you've been rambling on about for five minutes? Mm. Never forgot that one because what I realized is that I was giving my propositional message to the client instead of asking the type questions that would draw them out. Now that was a lesson I learned real early. And so I think what Peter types and others, sometimes we get so excited about wanting to impact and influence others that we don't listen to really where they're coming from. So uh, so I, I have a mantra that's in that I've had for 40 plus years and it goes off in my head all the time when I'm serving. And it, that is this, before I tell, ask. Mm. After I ask, listen. After I listen, respond, and always show that I care with Christ-centered compassion. Mm. That mantra is, I mean, it, it has served me well because what my tendency is and what sometimes, David, I think... Well, I think all pastors, I mean, because we've been trained to take truth and give it to somebody. Yeah. We always say before we ask, we tell. And after we tell, we tell them again. Uh, and we're only wanting them to get what we have to say because we care. But I found if you learn how to ask the question first and maybe several times, then you can really get a context and really know that what the other person that needs at that moment, you do have something to share and to say, but put it into its proper context. How hard is that to overcome as a man because our, our fixed it nature? <laughs> oh, you know, I, there's, no, there's no question. Uh, I, there's another word that I use because uh, people ask me all the time about counseling, about, well, you're here to share the truth with someone, I said yes. Uh, but what I've found is that if I am too prescriptive mm -hmm. first, I'm writing out their prescription mm -hmm. and I'm giving it to them and now it's in your hands and are you going to fill it? And it really, uh, it, it, it really internally, people get offended by that. Mm -hmm. But I find if I am more descriptive, not prescriptive, if I will describe what I'm seeing in them, what I'm hearing you say, what I heard you say was, that was a phrase that I used. <laughs> Uh, Carl Rogers, yes, yeah, and Karkoff, uh, yeah, you, you, we, we had to study those little books. Uh, but what, what, what you're referencing, there is an actual training that you learn how to listen. Now think about that. We would spend a whole quarter sitting in a chair with someone in front of us, and they would tell us something that's in their, in their uh, d uh, describing some issue in their life, and the only thing we could say was, what I hear you saying is, and you repeat part of what they said. And then every, maybe after a two or three sentence maps go back and forth, you might have something added to, but you keep saying, well, well, what I hear you saying in this way, 
Well, I did a training at Chick-fil-A, my first training at Chick-fil-A that David's referencing on <laughs> communication. And that was at the corporate office. Uh, um, you had uh, Bubba and Dan and all of their executive committee and, and their top leaders were coming to hear me talk about communication. <laughs> so you know what I did? If, if we were in the same, uh, this room like this, I, first of all, the whole morning had them pair up together, sit across from each other, lean forward in the chair with their arms, and someone tells, says something, the only thing you can say is, what I hear you saying mm -hmm. is, and repeat it. Yeah. Well, we went through that exercise, and then broke for lunch, and oh my gosh, I would hear, I, I had one would come to say, are, is this all that we're going to be doing? <laughs> and, and, and the others were murmuring. Said, "I, I got things I got to do. I was just here." Well, I went through that. We got through the day. You know, we did bring some other additive stuff in, but fast forward about twenty years when I did my first training in the early '80s. I started working with the Kathy family in the tw in. Uh, in the early 20s, to 2001. And I became their family business consultant and I, out of my counseling experience, uh, they wanted uh, uh, someone to come and help them have a successful transition from Gen 1, which is the founding owner, Truett, to Gen 2, which is the sibling partnership, to Gen 3, which is the cousin consortium. So I've helped them with their governance structure and their family about dealing with that transition. But when I showed up back at the <laughs> corporate office with the family, I'd walk through the halls there and their senior executives would come up and say, what I hear you saying, <laughs> and it stuck after 20 years, so it does work. <laughs> you know, Ron, it's, it's a pretty amazing thing. So say it again because one time, and look, these guys are way sharper, but for me, I, you, gotta, you gotta say it again. The, the thing in your mind that's always going off about to ask questions. All right, let's practice this. Okay. Before you tell, ask. All right, before you tell, ask. That's a, mm -hmm. that's a but I'm telling you that's a hard thing for a After preacher. you ask, <laughs> listen. <laughs> And then, no, you tell me what I said. <laughs> okay, so you just said, after you ask, listen. Mm -hmm. After you listen, respond. After I listen, I respond. And always show that I care with Christ-centered compassion. Hmm. Always show that I care with Christ-centered compassion. Yeah. He did. Wait, 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 guys. If I can get it. But you, you know, Ron, what's really fascinating to me is one of the things that we're doing in the school system with these kids, we teach them to listen. To ask, I mean, ask questions, listen, respond, and then act. And, and, with, act. The, and, and with the Christian kids, we're showing them how to do this. Okay, go ask, notice somebody, ask them questions, get their story. You've got to listen well. They'll ultimately ask you your story, but then ultimately you shift it to the Jesus story and help them with that Christ. You do that Christ-centered compassion. And I've been amazed at this younger generation responds to the idea of listening because nobody's listening to them. So what I'm hearing you say is that after you go through the asking and the responding with Christ-centered compassion, you need to act and have a plan of action. And you need to help that those yeah. students have a plan of action because without that, they're just left without any real conscious way of applying. And we, it's, it's simple stuff like the next time you see that person, ask them, hey, how did that, are things better at the house? Or, you know, and simple things like, uh, we, we got a girl who did that listen and stuff like that. She actually found out that the girl at school that she had started ministering to, and I've just used the biblical term, it was her birthday and she was new. It was her birthday and nobody was doing anything. She called her mom and says, Mom, can I take this girl 
And this is a senior in high school, a sophomore, says, can I take her shopping today? And you know, a girl from a single parent home being taken shopping because mom doesn't have any money. She takes her shopping, buys her birthday present. She comes back a couple of weeks later and says, Mom, this girl doesn't have a ride to the game. She has to ride home on the bus. She didn't have a way back to the game. Can I bring her home with me? Hmm. So now we got a girl who's lost, starts coming over to this girl's house. First time she's been with a mom and dad that love each other, where there's love in the home, Christ in the home. And the mom was telling this story. She said, you know, the crazy thing, she keeps coming over to my house, and she started asking the most random of faith questions. How about that? Because she's do she's done what, and, and listen, if a girl a senior in high school modeled yeah, it, yeah, and the moms, the mom and dad are like, okay, we get this. Well, can I make a, a little commercial yeah. here for a minute? It was I hadn't seen David in how long? Years and years and years since the nineties. Since the nineties, so. I have been with David Ferguson working with him with his uh, Great Commandment Network and, mm -hmm. and all that he's done with marriages uh, through the Windshake Foundation and Windshake Marriage. And so I got an invite by David, uh, by uh, David Ferguson, David Ferguson to come to a meeting of educators, I believe it was. And so I sat right back there where you are and I just dropped in. And I saw what was happening with the Bartow Cares program. And I saw what was being taught about relational values. And I saw the way in which there was interaction and questions by the leaders. And I was blown away. It had depth to it. And when I had lunch afterwards with David and David Ferguson and David Franklin and some of the other staff, I was so encouraged by what is happening in Bartow County and amongst the churches, amongst your chamber, amongst your schools. Let me tell you, you are a beacon. You, uh, you know, you're, you're, sometimes when you're right in the middle of something that is impact, you're not fully aware of what's going on. I, I don't think the disciples fully understand what they were engaged and involved in at that time. But when it comes to what I saw and where the needs of our, of, our, of, our, of our schools, of our churches, of our communities, I saw that right here in Bartow County, there are seeds of the healthiest way of addressing the cultural and the spiritual challenges that are in, uh, in our world. And so I'm a huge fan now, and David and I have had several conversations and that's what's led to be being here because I truly am wanting and, and others, I've encouraged others to follow what's happening with Bartow Cares. I talked to Bubba and Cindy Cathy just this morning. We had a Windshake uh, Foundation meeting this morning and I told them where I was going mm -hmm. to Bartow County and she said, oh, Glenn and Susie Jordan. <laughs> Anybody know Glenn and Susie? Uh, yeah, y'all know I, we ate their, their Chick-fil-A and and, uh, and it says, oh, and our uh, our uh, support, uh, our uh, distribution center or our supply center is here, and you know, and, and of course, uh, up at Barry. And she says, you tell those pastors how much we appreciate you and the fact of the ministry that you are to even the windshake staff members who come, who some probably come to your churches or for sure who are working in this at, at Chick-fil-A. He said, be sure to tell them how much we love, appreciate, and respect them. So I, I, that's directly from Bubba Cathy, uh, who is the, uh, Truett's second son. And uh, that was this morning. So I want you to know you represent what is really an opportunity to implement all of the, 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 the things we're talking about and the things that are being shared and taught and relational values and all, you are at the epicenter of that right now. So I hope you'll recognize that. And uh, the fact that you're here, I think you do recognize it. And uh, the fact that we are, uh, we are here to encourage one another because this is not easy stuff right now. 
I, I, it's, it's gotten so complex, complicated, we're seeing what's happened in our world. We do know Jesus is coming back mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because uh, of what we're seeing. But anyhow. But, you know, Ron, I think that you so said that we know. Commercial to thank you for what you're doing. We, we know Jesus is coming back, but we're called to be light. And it sure shifted from a culture that I came along in when everybody had read the Bible or had it quoted in schools or prayed to now a culture that doesn't know Jesus. And we, we got to still be light. You've taken that into the corporate world in a most unusual way because you, you know, when I met you, you were doing all the alpha care and counseling. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up going in the corporate world and the coaching that you do and the principles, how you use biblical principles in the corporate world because I, there's an opportunity for that. I mean, I'm going in businesses right now and it's crazy the response I'm getting. Yeah. Well, I, and, and David's right. It's, uh, it was an incredible opportunity when. I did not ask to become a family business consultant. Uh, the Cathy's asked me, and uh, I began to see the, uh, the need and the effect of this, not only the generational transfer in their family, but uh, in their communities as well. And so um, I just, just showed up and uh, listened and tried to respond, and the Lord really opened up the door for working with a lot of companies. I've had about 16 families in 20 years, and uh, the families that I've had uh, are very, uh, I'm so thankful that they're committed to Christ-centered causes and philanthropy. Um, uh, it, uh, it's for public reasons, I'll, I won't share with you uh, some of the ones there, but, uh, but there, there are some families, well-known families that you would know that I've had the privilege of, of serving. And I'm seeing how important the marketplace is to really to reach uh, our world now. And so your investment in the business leaders that you have in your church and, and finding out what their needs are, because many times the business leaders think the the pastors and the church shows up when they need something, right? Uh, you know, uh, and, and we do, you do. I, I'm not saying that you don't, but you know, really take the time to realize how much of a ministry you can be to encourage them to be their salt and light in their community. And as far as with Jesus is concerned, and, there, and when I hear about Jesus, I go, uh, we, we had a campaign back in the 70s. Does any of y'all remember the I Found It campaign? Does anybody? I see a couple of nods. A lot of you are not. We, we had it here in Atlanta, remember? Listen, I was too young. <laughs> oh, you were too young. But your dad. My yeah, dad. Your dad yeah. is right in the middle of it, sure. I guarantee you. But we had I Found It campaign. It was on the billboards, the bumper stickers and everything. And it, it was, I, I found it was that I, I found Jesus. And so it just was an I found it teaser for, and then there was a, a follow-up campaign to really introduce evangelism in, in, into it, uh, the community. Uh, but there's a movement now that's, uh, that I wanted to see if y'all are familiar with that's called He Gets Us. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen those? Yeah. That He yeah. Gets Us? Well. When I heard that he gets us, I said, wait a minute, uh, we, we f I found it first, but now he gets us. Uh, and what's being uh, really by a conscientious effort, one of the, one of the families that I've served is a, is a key backer of the, of the he, he Gets Us uh, campaign. And um, actually I filled out a application yesterday for a, a meeting at the end of November that's uh, called um, that's called Jesus Now Summit. It's the Jesus Now Summit, and so it's the combination of the chosen leaders, you know, the chosen, mm -hmm. and the He Gets Us campaign group and the Barna uh, group research, and they're all coming together in Dallas in a, in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I've been invited to join, and we'll be able to see. What is the current movement for the I Found It campaign to really penetrate and, and work with, with the communities? Because this is a, I, I, I want to be careful how I say this, uh, uh, 
Jesus needs no introduction, <laughs> but this is a reintroduction into some cultural darkness mm -hmm. about who gets us and who Jesus is. So when I've seen the commercials, and or, or the, uh, the, yeah, I guess they are, the, uh, the spots, you know, all of them are so diverse and all, and I've, I've, I've understood the background now of where they're going, but one of the, 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 the air game, so to speak, is all the commercials that you're seeing, but they're, they've got a very strategic ground game that now is being implemented. And so that's what's going to be a part of this meeting, how to take what has been implemented at a, at a, at a broad air game level to what is an on-the-ground level so that we work with local churches to really expand and how to address the explorers who are coming to uh, find out what, what do you mean he gets us? And, 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 and when they see Jesus introduced at the end of every commercial on he gets us, uh, this is an opportunity that I think will be where we can have another light in the community. And you know, Ron, that's exactly what this whole marriage, the uh, keeping marriages healthy is. <clears throat> Some parenting things we're trying to work on and you know, sometimes it's hard to get the first year everything to fall together just perfectly. But uh, I think we've got an opportunity. I'm seeing that in the schools. The receptivity of kids, when I express care to them, authenticness, their response is unbelievable. I took a teenage boy to dinner the other night. Dad's in jail, been there since he was four years old. He has no role model. He told me, he said, every man in my family is a bad role model. And he kind of looked at me like, okay, you're the guy that, I was like, okay, God, I, I, I get this. And here I am at 62. And this teenager wants to hang out with me. And I'm like, okay, I think we've got the opportunity of a lifetime from a cultural standpoint, but how do we get the church engaged because they're not showing up maybe on Sunday morning, even though in Bartow County, we're starting to see more visitors show up with no church background. And so they, they but they're, they're relating to things different. And it's like, okay, I, I, I'm 62, and I think I know less right now about how to preach and do mm -hmm. church than I've ever known. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I was in Marietta, we were doing home groups, relationship okay. stuff. We thought we were cutting edge, and now I think, man, I'm so far behind of everything. But, well, I'm, I'm with you in there. You know, we, you know when, when I lost all my hair, you know, I, you know it's a good sign of, uh, of uh, you know, clearing, clearing the mind of, uh, of what was uh, being clogged up in there. But I'm really needing to really understand. We're all needing to understand because I'm, I'm, I'm so concerned about my grandchildren that I, we have now and, and, and my children. And with what's been accelerated in our, in our world today, uh, we, we are going to be, and we are on the front lines now. It's not what's happening globally. It's what's happening in our community. And I, once again, want to want to commend you. Uh, when I filled out the application yesterday to attend this, uh, I've already heard you mention one of the things. They asked the question that, of us, what are the top three essentials for the church in America to address to reach those who are not, who are spiritually open but not yet following Jesus? So that was one of the questions I had to respond. What would you, how would you answer to that? It's funny, when David was speaking earlier, I was going to bring this up and it um, wasn't appropriate, but this will work. Most of y'all have heard of George Barna research, and um, I came across this recently. <clears throat> this, the topic is Christians and non-Christians possess many identical or similar attitudes, values, and opinions. You know what the number one is? This Marriage retreat, the number one percent Christians answered, your family is, quote, very important to you. 97% Christians, non-Christians, 96%. The second category was that you believe you have a shared responsibility in helping poor or people who are struggling. 91% Christians, 86% non-Christians. There are a lot of similar values that we don't leverage in the church that people value family and people value marriages. It's, it, what you're talking about is relationships. Mm -hmm. Ron, our time is always 
gets away from us. But okay. I want to I want to ask you a simple thing because you know I'm not going to ask you your age, but I know you're over seventy. You uh, you're not slowing down. God keeps giving you assignment. Give me a little bit about what's driving you right now, because I find myself with more passion for Jesus and for the kingdom than I've ever had in my life. Well, I, you know, I've, I've, uh, I don't even know. I, the Bible doesn't even talk about retirement, so I have no idea uh, how that became such a pursuit. I, and I do know that in certain corporate circles, you know, you have to get away from what your work is to do something. But as far as the calling that was on me and what the Lord spoke, I'm going to go breathe and, and just show up till the day I die. And, and I, I would, I know that each of us, you know, because we're, we've got some young bucks in here, but, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm one of the oldest, I'm sure. I'm 71 now. So, uh, I, I had my, my cardiologist uh, say when he heard everything that I was doing and, you know, checking on my blood pressure and all, he said, Ron, I need you to do this uh, maybe uh, at least once a week. I need you to just look in the mirror for about a minute and just look at your at who you are at this age. Mm -hmm. I said, well, why do I do that? <laughs> because then you have to balance out how you look with how you, what you eat, what, how you exercise, and, and he was doing, he was making that uh, comparison. So I look in there, my, my, and I'm thinking, oh Lord, I guess, I guess I am looking older than a lot of other, that I see myself. Uh, <laughs> and so I need to recognize that. But I, I am not giving up. Matter of fact, I'm, my, my wife at, retired uh, in September from teaching <laughs> middle school science for 42 years wow. yeah. so she just took a break and I took her on a cruise last uh, two weeks ago uh, and that was the first time in 42 years that we could go and do a, a, a cruise uh, during the school year right. so we, we did that but so I'm saying I'm I'm in the game and gonna keep keep serving as long as uh, the mind keeps working <laughs> Uh, but I also want to balance out my own life with making sure I'm taking care of myself. Because when Jesus said the two greatest commands were to love God and to love others as you love yourself. Mm -hmm. So even though I'm going to stay active, I need to take care of my family, take care of my uh, health, take care of my uh, uh, uh commitments and be be conscientious so I I think that's when I get prescriptive for just a moment if you if you give me that privilege that, mm -hmm. that uh, uh, the reason why my cardiologist said he needed to do that because he, he, he was the Kathy's cardiologist and Truett's cardiologist and, and he, they, they, he said I want you to hang around for a long time mm -hmm. and so if you're going to hang around as long as God will have you, we have a responsibility in making sure we're taking care of ourselves. So, All right, one last question because we got about two minutes, okay? Because we never did get into the whole corporate coaching mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. So, you're not doing the counseling stuff anymore. You're doing all this stuff way more than it's like Forrest Gump. You didn't start off this way. So, embracing all of these crazy changes. Because so, these guys are facing a culture of it they didn't sign up for. How, give us some wisdom and counsel on how do we embrace the change that come, comes in our life because it's everything's changing. Wow. I don't have an easy answer for that because I ask it every morning. Lord, uh, what is it am I responsible for? And what is it you're responsible for? The Lord, back in, uh, I'll just reference this and then we'll close. Uh, I had a calling in my life, and uh, I'm, I'm heading up a, a group called World Without Orphans now. We are in 45 countries doing foster care initiatives around the world. And in, in my calling uh, that related to that, I had an encounter.
encounter with the Lord in Switzerland, and that was in February 9th of 1995. And I'm going to try to get through it to tell you what happened, because I think God gave me a release to share this encounter when I was 70. Because I had only shared what I'm about to share with you um, uh, maybe a half a dozen times. It was one of those encounters that you just couldn't talk about unless I just started weeping. But I had an encounter with the Lord and it, it, and it turned my direction that I think has led to all the other activities that I've been involved in. After I was praying in John 10, mm. and the, the good shepherd, and the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. And I was meditating on that. And all of a sudden, I started having a real visceral experience. I was in a, in a, uh, in a, a hotel room that nobody else was around, <clears throat> and I started having this uh, labor labored, breathing, and I thought I was having a heart attack, I was afraid, I was scared, all that was happening. And then uh, all of a sudden, out of John 10, uh, the Lord said, uh, it's time to put away childish things. You have been preparing for this moment. Close your eyes and write what you see. So, I'm a I'm a scratcher, you know, I'm a left-handed scratcher. So I literally, and I, I, as God is my witness, I, I, I was on my face and I was weeping because I was afraid, I was scared. I thought I was gonna die. And that message came about close your eyes and write what you see. So I closed my eyes and I saw fire and said, this is fire. The first one, I've heard the cry of my people. The second one, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit will remain. The third was, to whom much is given, much is required. The fourth was, I will bring laborers to the harvest. And the fifth was, you will be anointed with power by the Spirit, and the work you perform will not be your own, but will be for my purposes to bring healing to my people. And I just had, a, I just went to total peace after that. And you know, I, I'm a pretty conservative guy. And you know, I, when people come to counseling, they, they tell me about their visions, and I say, "Yeah, right, uh huh." <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, this, I mean, yeah. this was undeniable. And I just said, "Oh no!" I said, "Oh Lord, I, I'll never be the same," and, and and I haven't. But I went and told my psychiatrist who was on that trip with me uh, what happened. I lived Barney Davis. I said, Barney. Let me tell you what happened to me. And I had my book and I showed him what I wrote and, and I, I can show it to you. I still have it. And uh, he said, he listened to it. And I said, Barney, what am I going to do? He said, oh, this one's easy. <laughs> what do you mean it's easy? He said, he said, well, look at those five things that you've written. He said, God says, I've heard the cry of my people. What does it have to do with you? <coughs> You've not chosen me, but I've chosen you. Who chooses? To whom much is given, much is required. Well, who's the giver? I will bring laborers to the harvest. Is that your responsibility? And you'll be anointed with power by the Spirit. And the work you perform will not be your own, but be for my purposes to bring healing to my people. And I said, Barney, you're right. And at that moment, any burden of what do I have to do became, Lord Jesus, who do I need to become? And the reason why I can free to share that now is that I realized that I wasn't the only one that had heard that. 
you've heard the same thing in your own way. And I want to call that out in you. That remember, it's not our responsibility. It's our response to his ability. I'm just an ordinary person who can do extraordinary things because this ordinary has laid hold of the extraordinary Jesus. So that's my word to you. This is the first time I've truly shared that publicly. Like I've done it individually. As I want to ask you to, I want to ask you to bow your head right now, Ron. That last thing about who we're supposed to become—that's God's. Would you pray right now and just sit before God for a moment and just say, God, Father, talk to me and ask Him, guys. Instead of asking, you'll receive. Ask him to start the journey. Not about what your church is supposed to become or your ministry is supposed to become, but who you're supposed to become. Father, 2023 is close to the end. As we start a 2024, I sense we just heard a word from you for each one of us. Would you in 2024 help us, lead us, guide us through your Holy Spirit to become? Our identity is not in what we do, not the church we serve. It's it's in you, and help us to know what we're supposed to become. Father, thank you for Ron being here today. And Lord, what an encouragement it is to hear somebody who is, uh, hadn't quit and is helping right now us know how to step into this moment in a changing culture and world. And Lord, what he prayed there, what he said, you said to him at the very end, you'll bear much fruit. It's been something you've been pressing me with. Lord, may we bear much fruit in Bartow County and beyond, and beyond. Lord, to think that uh, knowing Ron back in the 80s that you've taken him to 45 countries doing all kind of stuff with children, that who would have ever seen that? Lord, we're yours, so whatever you want to do with us, we want to say yes right now. And we want to pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Guys, before you jump up, Ron, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I offer a gift to somebody? Yes, you can. Now, now this is going to be way out of bounds, but I'm forced to jump, okay? Uh, one of the things that God allowed me to do after in my early, in the early 2000s, I, I said I played basketball and I, I played tennis and golf. Any of y'all golfers out here? A few golfers, um, you know. Um, uh, I, I had I was doing some coaching with some athletes, and that's uh, done in sports psychology. And 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 uh, uh, you've heard of the Ryder Cup. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul Azinger, and, and, and Paul, he's a broadcaster now on NBC, but he was a Ryder Cup captain. And, and uh, he and I, I've worked with him for a couple of years, and then we stopped. And I was doing coaching, and uh, he came back as a Ryder Cup captain. And, Oh, for 08 Ryder Cup and the U.S. if you follow that and they just got beat bad in Rome mm -hmm. but uh, they they had lost a whole bunch uh, before the time of Paul and he had a uh, we were having dinner celebrating his captaincy I said well how are you going to match up your players then and what type of management style are you going to have and he looked like a management style what do you mean I'm just you know, going to be leading the team I said well if you had a strategy, what would you do? And he said, well, I saw this Navy SEALs documentary that take a, took a large team and broke it into small teams. And I thought, I, I'd like to break it up into small teams. So that's why I said, well, how are you going to match them up? He said, well, playing styles with a, a, a good hitter, a good putter, or whatnot. And that's when I said, well, what if you match them according to personalities rather than playing styles? 
And because if I'm under stress, which the Ryder Cup produces, I'd rather have somebody that has a like personality that I would process the stress similarly than somebody different. And he said, oh, don't give me your cycle babble. And, uh, <laughs> but later on, he said, what are you thinking? I said, I don't know, but why don't we work on it together? And he said, he said, uh, okay, let's let's do a, a, a team a team management type strategy, and we did. And I, he said to me at the beginning, Ron, now I can't pay you because this is the Writers Cups for God and country. There's nobody going to pay you. I said, well, you don't have to pay me. But he said, what do you want out of it? I said, well, if we lose. Nobody cares, and we go on like nobody cares about anybody that lost just a few weeks ago. But if we win, I said, I'd like to write a book with you that would chronicle what our team building strategy was. So that became Cracking the Code. This is the Ryder Cup. Wait, so the, the Ryder Cup won, so y'all didn't know that y'all were going to get to talk here from the secret to the U.S. winning the Ryder Cup, 2003. No, and, and, uh, and, and they actually did a film on it uh, two years ago, a golf film. If you, any of you have Peacock Network, it's called Cracking the Code. And uh, it's, it's about the Ryder Cup strategy and, and what we all did. But anyhow, I didn't know how many were going to be here, so I didn't bring them in. But I have a box of books out in my car that I would just, before we leave, if you filter out, I'd be glad for you to pick up a copy. Because right in the middle of it, you will see the, um, there's the disc profile of the, and Myers-Briggs that sort of shows how we implemented this. And you don't have, even have to be a golf fan or a golfer, but you'll see the team building strategy that we used and implemented, and I still speak on this, and people are using this strategy, so. Did they call Anyhow. you after this year? Pardon? Did they call you after this year? Well, there was an article that came out last week that said, bring back Paul, and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and every, every time they lost, our book sales go back there. And, uh, hey, I'm, hey, I'm an American, but. <laughs> just, uh, thank you. Listen, Rod, thanks, Rod. Hey, guys, before you leave, uh, Neil, would you come up here? This is, guys, you slipped in. I was hoping to have you speak early on, but this is uh, Judge Neil Brunt. He's with the Family Court. He and I have been partnering together. And uh, Judge, I wanted you to give these guys a personal invitation because it's got more weight when it comes from you, okay? So you're, you're the owner of the whole Family Court? Right. Yeah, the, the Juvenile Court of Barco County. The, uh, me and Judge uh, Josh Yearwood are the two judges here. Uh, we've been, I've been at the job since February of 16, been really focused lately on foster care and what we can do to improve the number and the service we have to foster families and other people that are involved in the system. We have around 170 kids in foster care right now, around 35 homes are licensed through Barco County. There are other groups such as Faith Bridge and groups such as that that also have other homes that we really do have a shortage there's shortage of support, they feel, so I'm trying to build a, start a coalition of working between the faith community and DFACS. We've had a few meetings. We're having a breakfast Monday morning at Cross Point uh, City Church. Everyone is invited. I'd love to have you come and just have presentations of various services that the faith community could do to assist foster families. No obligation, won't cost anything. We're going to have breakfast sponsored by Doug's. Uh, so if you please come, I would really love to see you there. I uh, do have cards here from uh, me and uh, Carolyn Davenport, who's a program director with our email addresses on it. If you could come, we'd really appreciate it. And let you know if they can come, right? Yes. Yes, yeah. So, so guys, RSVP. Yeah. listen, it's just a cool thing when we could be at a chamber, connections with the business community, now connections with government. Stuff just keeps happening in a good way. It's not common across America, <coughs> but God keeps doing uh, fun things here. Mm -hmm. And Judge, thank you for having a heart to want to do something with kids. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Listen, hey, uh, 